because of the lockdown, we have been able to actually find the time to write lots of papers. When focusing on the experimental side of things, it is easy for stuff to fall through the cracks and let publishable data sit on the side, because even though you feel it is good work, publishing it may not be a high priority at that point in time. Currently, we cannot access our labs, and most of our computational resources have been dedicated to COVID-19 research, so we have little else to do other than write papers. What this means, of course, is that in a few weeks or so, we will commence the battle of peer review, as we have submitted an eye-watering amount of work for review, and naturally, this stuff is on my mind. Considering that this channel sits in a community that revolves around pseudoscience, I see a lot of people arguing and asking others to back their point with peer-reviewed publications as the gold standard for evidence. So I thought that I would take a slightly different position and talk about peer review for a moment. As the title of this video may suggest, peer review is good, but it's not as good as what the gifted amateur makes it out to be. Even when done right, it is still not perfect, by virtue of it involving humans. That being said, as far as we can see, it is the best that we have. But I want to stress that just because something is in a peer-reviewed publication, it doesn't automatically mean that it is valid research. After all, Andrew Wakefield's nonsense went through peer review. So what does the process actually look like? Well, your manuscript lands on an editor's desk who quickly checks over the work. They make an editorial judgment on the basis of value, validity, and scope. The editor then kicks a decision, which is either a desk reject based on the work being obviously substandard, or more likely that they don't think it's right for the journal. But if they do like it, then they punt it on to reviewers. Usually there are two reviewers, sometimes three, and these are specialists in your field and they check the validity of the work. They then return the manuscript with a recommendation for the editor. This recommendation could be to publish as is or publish under the condition that certain changes are made. Now the first is pretty much unheard of. The second is the more common way in which a manuscript is accepted. When the reviewer gives feedback, they highlight shortcomings and opportunities for development, which you are required to address. This part is weird, because as a reviewer, you should try to be supportive and constructive, but you also have to be nasty and adversarial. And you have to simultaneously try to help the paper be as good as possible, whilst also trying to rip it to shreds. Another recommendation would be for the manuscript to be outright rejected, in which case the author probably makes some changes and approaches a different journal and tries there. But if accepted, the author makes the change that re is recommended by the reviewers and then submits the final version, and the manuscript uh, is then checked over by the editor to see whether the reviewer's comments have been appropriately addressed. At this stage, the usual things like proofreading and layout are covered and the article is published, although occasionally a reviewer may be involved again at this stage as well. If all of this is done well and in good faith, then you have a pretty decent system. Of course, the ultimate test is whether the community can repeat your result. As I said, just because something is peer-reviewed, it doesn't mean that it is correct. Taking everything in good faith just means that some highly qualified people did stuff and showed a thing and then some more really qualified people could not poke holes in it. So that's how the process should roughly work. You may notice that I have been stressing the word good faith because all of this is highly dependent on what field you work in. In some fields like mine, people are a bit more cutthroat and this process can be savage and make you doubt your life choices. It is also highly dependent on the submission type and the journal. One of the issues is that the whole process is double blind. You don't know who your reviewer is and they don't know whose work they are reviewing. Of course, this is a good thing, but unfortunately, it stays blind. The author's name will eventually become known to the reviewer, but the reviewer's name remains a mystery. And remember, the reviewer is a specialist in the subject of your paper. The closer your paper gets to the reviewer's specialism, the more likely it is that your reviewer is a member of a competing group. 
But then we have to consider the efficacy of double blinding as well. In certain groups, like mine, just giving the details of your methodology will identify you. And this leads to the first bit of abuse. The reviewer is able to hold your publication hostage. They could just sit on it to waste your time as they have something like that in the pipeline anyway and they want to beat you to the punch. Reviewers are expected to operate within certain timeframes. However, given that reviewers are hard to come by and they are unpaid volunteers, a lot of leeway is often given. If they are especially evil, they can take your idea, duplicate it, and publish it elsewhere. Now, I haven't personally experienced this one, but it has been known to happen, which makes you think that it is perfectly feasible that a reviewer tries this and submits this work, which subsequently gets reviewed by the author they were initially plagiarizing. So that's quite risky. But to slow you down even further, a reviewer can make ridiculous demands, which will take months to address which is something that I have directly experienced. Of course, there is also the very common practice of coercive citation, where the reviewer lists their own articles to be cited in the paper before it can be accepted. The aim of this is to increase the number of citations the reviewer receives, and that boosts their career. Most of the time, this is just cheeky, and it can often actually boost the quality of your work as well. But sometimes it is an outright pain in the ass when the reviewer demands that you cite some completely irrelevant work. And then you get the weird, daft feedback. The reviewer will commend you on a particular section and recommend that it would be published on the basis of that section. And then reviewer 2 will recommend that you kill that section. Yes, if academics were to make a movie, the villain's name would just be Reviewer 2. There are ways in which this can all be feasibly addressed. First, once the process is over, the reviewer's name should become known and attached to the publication. This leads to greater accountability and therefore fairness. Secondly, the reviewer should be remunerated for their efforts. This is not an easy task and it should be rewarded. Additionally, this will also lead to greater accountability as there's an economic contract between the publisher and the reviewer. The issues I have described are a pain in the ass, but mostly this will result in top quality work when it finally is published. This worst case scenario, uh, acceptance means that even your harshest critics and direct competitors could no longer justify stopping your work from being published. But there is the other extreme. Now, to provide a bit of context, in broad strokes there are two types of publications, open access and paywalled. And this is pretty much what it sounds. The open access publications are accessible to the public at no cost and the paywalled publications require a per article purchase or a subscription. Now, neither are cheap. To access an individual article behind a paywall, Joe Public needs to fork out around 20 to 30 bucks for a four page long article. And that's not cheap. And then you have the open access publications and their source of income isn't exactly based on like a small donation button at the end of the article or something. No, the author pays. Yes, after months or years of work and an arduous peer review process, the author still has to fork out several thousands of pounds for it to be published in a way that's accessible to the public. Yes, you provide the content and you pay the publisher for the privilege. Now, if you are at a large institution with a decent ideology, then this is not too much of an issue as your institution will fork this out. Funding organizations will also set money aside for this in your grant, especially if they require you to make your publications open access. However, if you work with a small grant and slightly less idealistic institutions, then this option isn't always too accessible. Of course, publishers are businesses that need to make money, but at the same time, the knowledge should be accessible to the public. After all, most public research grants are taxpayer funded, so this knowledge is effectively public property. On a side note, the European Union is currently exploring a means to create an open access journal without an open access fee, but you can kind of start to see how this process can be exploited by publishers because reviewers are anonymous so there is no accountability 
Even worse, peer review doesn't have an accepted standard definition, and as far as your company's internal policy is concerned, peer review could just be taken to mean I peered over it for a bit uh, whilst taking a dump. There is nothing stopping you from setting up a publishing house and accepting manuscripts in exchange for that sweet open access fee cash. These types of journals are called predatory journals, and they are the pseudoscientists' favorite. These journals are out there, and there are many of them. Now, at best, these journals are set up to exploit unexperienced academics and fleece them. Open access fees are generally much lower for predatory journals, and therefore made more enticing to researchers with limited budgets. So here we have fake publishing houses exploiting researchers, but there is something more nefarious going on with these predatory journals. It is a common tactic among anti-vaxxers and the climate change denial camp to write credible sounding bullshit and publish this in one of these journals. After all, the website says peer reviewed, so they can claim that the paper was subjected to peer review and their followers will lap this shit up as credible science. Once again, there is no standard definition of peer review and it is not a protected term. In these journals, you'll find papers with titles such as The Refutation of the Climate Greenhouse Theory and a Proposal for a Hopeful Alternative, among five others in the journal Environment Pollution and climate change. Now, this journal is run by Arthur Viterio, who is tied to the Heartland Institute. The articles have a woeful lack of scientific grounding and have generally been called laughable by the community. But it is peer-reviewed science because the website says so. It is well established that these tactics are employed to attempt to establish some legitimacy in the pseudoscience camp. After all, it is pretty unlikely that a legislator is up to scratch with these issues. All they need to hear is, it's peer-reviewed, and they will take it seriously. The CO2 coalition, which has significant clout in Donald Trump's administration, readily employs these tactics. They openly boast about how their members are key advisors in positions of the administration. One of the researchers they funded is Nils Axel Myrna, who used these kinds of journals to publish articles claiming that sea levels are not rising and that people in Fiji really shouldn't worry about said rising sea levels, even though coastal communities in Fiji keep finding that they have to relocate because of uh, rising sea levels. Of course, there is the lighter side of this. The uh, Electric Universe crowd also uses this little exploit to publish their nonsense or set up their own vanity publishing house. But then there is the outright funny part of this. To some, it is a sport to expose these journals. They play around with these asshats to demonstrate that the journal does not have any review processes or any legitimacy. Most notably, an engineer by the name of Alex Smolianinsky, I didn't pronounce that right, Alex Smolianinsky, that's the one, he wrote a paper uh, entitled Fuzzy Homogeneous Configurations and listed the authors as Margaret Simpson, Edna Gravapel, and Kim Yong Fun. The text is just randomly generated nonsense, and he managed to get it published twice. Another recent example is an article in the Scientific Journal of Research and Reviews entitled What's the Deal with Birds by Daniel Baldessari. The abstract reads, Many people wonder, what's the deal with birds? This is a common query. Birds are pretty weird. I mean, they have feathers, WTF. Most other animals don't have feathers. To investigate this issue, I looked at some birds. I looked at a woodpecker and a parrot and a penguin. They were all pretty weird. In conclusion, we may never know what the deal with birds is, but further study is warranted. Now, I am tempted to either start a racket to take some of this sweet open access cash from flat earth scientists, but instead, I think I will troll these journals by submitting absolute nonsense and subsequently expose them. This is going to take money though, so if this is something that you would be up for supporting financially then please let me know in the comments section. Depending on the response I may look into actually doing this and figure out the logistics and feasibility. 
I'm not 100% sure yet though, it does seem like this could be quite a time consuming project. On average, a submission to a predatory journal is roughly around $200. It is actually pretty hard to spot predatory journals. To make it even more difficult, there are predatory journals out there that publish top quality work. But that is something I won't go into, as uh, discussing these journals is uh, complicated and legally dangerous. There are resources available which list potential predatory journals. The most well known is Beale's List. Link is in the description. Now, the website also lists a few checks that you can perform for yourself to assess whether a journal is likely to be predatory. Please note the word likely, as Beale's List itself is somewhat problematic. Now, I think I will leave it at this. I had actually intended to do just a quick two minute short video on this topic, but it turns out that it is hard to be concise. I hope that I have instilled the message that not all peer review is born equal. Just because something says it has been peer reviewed, it doesn't mean that it is correct or even that it actually has been reviewed at all. As it's the same with everything else, be careful with the information that is out there. So with that, I would like to thank you all for watching and thanks to my patrons who make this all possible. Now let me know if baiting predatory journals is something you would give your financial support. I may look into doing that uh, if it is something that enough people will get behind and then I can figure out the logistics as well. But anyway, until next time.